Oh, he, he is, is the light. I said that he is the way, the way, the way. way. He the truth, the truth. The I said that he is the way. way. He is the, the truth. truth. He is the light. I know that he is the way, the way, the way. way. He the truth, the truth. I said the truth. he is the, the way, way, the truth, the, the light. Listen to me now. No man coming unto the Father except they come through He. He is the way. Yeah. He is the truth. Oh, he is the light. Listen to me. Ooh. No man coming unto the Father except they come through He. He is the way. Oh. He is the truth. He, he is the light. I said that He. Is the way. The way. The, the way. way. He the truth. The truth. I the truth. said that He is the way. He is the truth. Oh. The light. I know that He. The way, the way, the, the way, way, the truth, the truth, the truth. I know that he is the, the way, way, the truth, the light. And Philip asked me, said, Lord, can you show us the Father? And that'll be enough for me. He is the way, oh, he is the truth, oh, he is the light. And Jesus answered, Ooh. don't you know I'm the Father? And that the Father's in me. He is the way, oh, he is the truth, he is the light. Yeah, I said that he the way, the way, the I way. Say he is. The truth, the truth. The I truth. said that he is the way, he is the truth, he is the light. I said he is the way, the way, the I way. He is. The truth, the truth. I said he is the way, the truth, the light. Oh yes, he is. I know that he is. The way, the way, the way. I said he is. The truth, I know that he is the way, he is the truth, he is the light. I said that he. The way, the way, the way he is. The truth, the truth. I said it is the way, the truth, the light. All right, welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to The Way, The Truth, and The Life. My name is George Boyd, Jr., and I'm the minister here in Greenville, Texas, at the Wheelan Church of Christ. So if you are ever in the area, please, please come by and visit us as we are a Bible church that does Bible things, Bible ways. And so today, we're going to kind of wrap up this whole thing in the book of Numbers. Now, we will probably talk a little bit more about Caleb and uh Joshua in the future, but definitely we're going to wrap up this instance in the book of Numbers 13 and 14. And I think this is really a very, very powerful lesson on what it means to follow God, what it means to follow God, because I think we all have to realize something. A lot of people, you know, they they like to talk about the grace and the mercy and the long suffering of God and the mistakes that everyone makes and we hear a lot of this type type of talk today in our society. But we have to be very, very careful that in all of that caring about people, that we don't put people above God. We don't put people above God. That even though Moses is going to intercede on behalf of the people, and God does want us to make sure that we continue to show mercy on people. But we also have to make sure that we don't be so caught up on that side that we begin to defend stupidity. And I'm going to say stupidity because when people hear and know what the truth is and they know the rules or whatever the case is, and then they go against that which they know to be true, That person is just ignorant. It's stupidity to know what right is and what will help you to achieve success and then to do the very opposite of that which helps you to achieve success. I've said it before, but I think we have to understand something that people do not realize that success is free. Success is really free. If you will just put in the work to do what you have to do to achieve it. But there is a high cost to to pay for failure. There is a cost to pay for failure. You're going to pay the cost. You're going to lose a lot whenever you fail. And typically people fail not from trying. They fail from not doing what is right. People trying to take shortcuts, trying to 
uh, not go along with the rules, trying to find different ways of doing things. But there's only one way to do what is right, and that's straight ahead, following God steadfastly. That's, that's how we do that which is right. And so today I, I, I posed as a title, when, when does God leave us or when is God not with us? And I know people will say, well, God is always with us. That's what he told the disciples. But I want you to follow something. Yes, God is always with us. The problem is we're not always with God. God, if you pay attention, it is rare occasion where you see something to where God leaves people in the Bible. In every instance, people leave God. People leave God. And even if God turns his back on people, in a sense, metaphorically, God turned his back because the people had already turned their back on him. And so God is saying something. You know, you think about the prodigal son. I think one thing that God tells us, whether we realize it or not, is he's full of grace and mercy and he's long suffering, but he's not going to chase us. God's not going to chase us. We turn our back on God and God is going to chase us around like little children. I, I remember when I was young and it came time for chastisement and we would try to run from our uh, and, and, and matter of fact, sometimes we could play that game with our aunts and they would laugh about it. But when it came to the men, uh, my dad would tell you in a heartbeat, I'm not going to chase you. I'm not going to chase you. Don't run from me because my dad was basically telling me something because if you run from me, it's going to be way worse when you do come to me. And that's the same thing with the prodigal son that God didn't chase the prodigal son. Now he was waiting on the son to come back, but God didn't chase the prodigal son. And that's kind of what we see here when we look in the book of Numbers and start studying just how God, when he passed the judgment on these people, God was basically telling Moses that even though Moses interceded, God was basically telling Moses, I'm not going to chase these people. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to chase them. I have been long suffering with them. I've been showing them mercy all of this time. And all they do is continue to murmur and complain against me. And no matter how much I lead them through you, I'm leading them physically. We know about the smoke in the pillar of light or the, or the pillar of fire that they're following. But God is also leading them through Moses, through telling them what he wants them to do. And no matter how God is guiding them, they won't follow. And it's the same thing with people today. People will have great churches, no great godly people, have great godly parents, have great godly family members, great examples, and they'll have a great church structure. They'll have a great preacher, and people will still go where they want to go and do what they want to do. But at the end of the day, God isn't chasing people the way, the way people want to proclaim that God is so good as if he's chasing them. No. God knows he's good. The problem is we're not want, it seems like that many people don't want to show God that they're good and appreciate how good that he really is. And so God is waiting on us rather than, I know we think that, you know, that, that we have all the time in the world. But God is only going to wait so long, and we don't know when God is going to allow things to happen in our lives. When is our life going to end? We, we have no clue. So we got to live every single day like it is our last day and not do all of this murmuring and complaining and disobeying God. But we got to learn how to do a better, better job of following God. So let's, let's get into this text. I think there is some beautiful stuff in here as we as we start looking at this whole thing in numbers. And we're going to pick up in numbers 14. We're going to pick up in numbers 14. Let us turn here real quick. I got a few other Bibles open over here, too, because there's some some things that I'm going to show you here that I think is very, very powerful and germane to this whole discussion that we're going to have. So. Let's go. Numbers. 
Numbers 39. We only have six verses today, so we're going to try to get through these expeditiously if possible. Numbers 39. And so we pick up where God has announced to Moses the punishment that he is going to put on the people of God. The ten spies who went up with Joshua and Caleb, they have died by the plague of before the Lord. These men, uh, they died by the plague before the Lord. And so now we see where the people from 20 years and up, they're going to, and basically this is the, the generation that he's brought in, this older generation. The judgment has been pronounced that they are going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. One year for every day the 10 or the 12 spies uh, spied out the land. And so the older generation is basically what's being talked about, that they're going to wonder, as it says here in uh, verse 31, it says, let me go up here because I want to make sure that we get this just right. He says here in verse 28, say unto them, truly as I live, said the Lord, as ye have spoken in mine ears, so will I do to you. Your carcasses shall fall in the wilderness and all that were numbered of you, according to the whole number, from 20 years old and upward. And so basically we see that those who are 19 and below, that God is kind of counting them still as children. You know, and I know we have these discussions about the age of accountability. I remember, you know, people be talking about, oh, when you turn 12 years of age, your sins are on you. I don't know where we really get that from because if we look at the book of Numbers, it seemed like that God said 19 and below that God was not going to count that against them, that it was the older, the 20 and above, that God said that they were not going to make it into the promised land, but they would wonder, and their children, those 19 and below, would watch them and watch them fall dead in the wilderness. And so as we get to verse 39, we're going to see now where God is going to really, where, where things are really going to continue to take shape. And we're going to see some very powerful things here that I'm going to point out about not obeying God. And so it says that Moses told these sayings unto all the children of Israel. So basically, Moses is pronouncing them their judgment. He's telling them what's going to happen. And, you know, we may think, oh, wow, man, that's real cold. Well, God has already told us the same thing, that when Jesus returns, those who were with God through Jesus, they're going to meet him in the sky. You're going to meet Jesus in the sky, and they're going to meet all of those who died before them in the sky, and then we're all going to fly away to heaven together. But the rest, they will be burning, not burned up but they will be in the hellfire when God burns up all of this other stuff. And so people know their judgment. People know their judgment. But I'm going to tell you something. Pride is a ugly thing. Pride is a very ugly thing. Because when people have so much pride, think about this. Moses has basically pronounced judgment and told them what was going to happen in verse 39. It says, look, when he told them these sayings, all the children of Israel, it says, and the people mourned greatly. They mourned greatly. But look at verse 40. And they rose up early in the morning and got them up into the top of the mountain saying, lo, we be here and will go up unto the place which the Lord hath promised, for we have sinned. Now, let me tell you something once again about pride. Proverbs 16, 18 tells us what? Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. 
these people are so prideful that after Moses pronounces the judgment, rather than them having a sorrowful repentance, rather than them jumping to the ground and bowing down, putting their face to the ground, like we saw Moses and Aaron do when they interceded or they wanted to intercede for the people on behalf of the people to God. These people, they're mourning, but then they rise up the next morning. And now, after the judgment has been pronounced, now they're going to go into the promised land. Oh, now they're going to go into the promised land. And you say, well, why do you say they have pride? Because in verse 25, watch this. They have already been told something in verse 25. Tomorrow, it says, now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwelt in the valley. Tomorrow turn you and go into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. God had already told him, nope, don't go into the promised land. Moses has even pronounced judgment. Nope, don't go into the promised land. Because you wouldn't let God leave, lead you because you wouldn't listen to God. And they bought a bad report. And y'all heard the bad report and y'all went along with the bad report and you went and wept and cried and threatened to stone folk and all kinds of stuff. God has now said, don't go into the promised land. Instead, go to the wilderness by the Red Sea. You're going to wonder. Why would they not repent? Why would they not do what Aaron and Moses did? But instead... They're so prideful that even in their judgment, they're going to continue to do what they want to do. Even in their judgment, they're going to continue to do what they want to do. Because I'm going to tell you something about people. When people turn off, when people turn off their ear to God, they turn off their ear to you and anyone who wants to say what is right. They're going to do whatever they want to do. And one of the worst things that happens to people is when they're so prideful that they don't have a repentant mind, they have a guilty mind. And rather than acting out of faith, see, people don't realize that even repentance is a part of faith. Even repentance is a part of faith. That's what John teaches us in John chapter 1, because uh, 1 John 1, because the issue becomes that if we sin, but if we repent, well, then God is quick to forgive us. But when people won't repent and they would rather have guilt than repent and then start doing things out of guilt rather than faith and a sorrowful repentance. God does not leave those people, but those people have actually left God. See, once again. They, they are saying they're following God in their guilt, but the issue is they're not following God in their guilt. They're still following their own lust and doing what they want to do. Oh, well, since God is mad at us, well, we're going to go ahead and do, we're going to go ahead and go on in here. You ever have, ever have this happen with your children? You tell your children what to do and then bad, and they don't do it and then bad stuff. They see how angry you may get with them and then something bad happens and then they go, oh, well, I'm just going to go ahead, then I'll just go ahead and do what you told me to do. No, 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 it's too late now. It's too late now. You've already broken what could have been fixed or what would not have been broken had you just did what I said. But now you want to go and try to make matters worse, and rather than just say you're sorry and, and, okay, well, what can I do going forward? The person now wants to do what has been asked to do when it's too late to do what's been asked to do. It's the same thing with people. When, when Jesus returns, it's going to be too late. It's going to be too late. And it's the same thing with people. And I know people don't like this, but these whole things about deathbed confessions. What, what is a deathbed confession? That someone waits until they're about to give their last breath of life. And then they accept 
they accept God? How? How do you do that? It, it, it doesn't make sense because now it's not repentance, but it's more guilt. But God wants people to change their minds and follow him and not follow him out of guilt. And this is what we're seeing when we deal with them, because notice, I'm sorry, I digress. But in Numbers 125, he had told them, turn to the wilderness. You're, you're, you're not going into the promised land. And even when we look at, and let's see if we can pull this up, because Moses is even more revealing when we look at Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 40. Look at this. But as for you, turn you and take your journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. And look at what Moses said. They were so hard-headed. It says, then ye answered and said unto me, we have sinned against the Lord. We will go up and fight according to all that the Lord our God has commanded us. Wait a minute. Watch this. People do this. But you're not doing as God has commanded you. Because God told you to go towards the wilderness and go towards the Red Sea. Go to the wilderness. But they decide now because, well, we're not going back there. At every turn, they're just not listening to God. They're just not listening. And so they instead decided that now they were going to go to war, even though they had been told not to do it. It says, and when ye had girded up on every man his weapons of war, ye were ready to go up into the hill. And the Lord said unto me, send unto them, say unto them, go not up, neither fight, for I am not among you, lest ye be smitten before your enemies. So I spake unto you, verse 43, and ye would not hear, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord and went presumptuously up into the hill. Oh, I love this because, see, that word presumptuously, when we look at how that's translated, it's very powerful when we look at how that's translated because that means in that particular context to go above God, to go above God. That they basically assumed that it's a presumption that God is not with them any longer. But they're still going to do as if God is going to still be with them after they have decided to leave God. When we leave the commandments of God, God is not with us because we've left him. God is not with us because we've left him. That's when God is not with us. And Moses is telling them something. They've left God. They have flat out left God. And so as we go back here and we look at Deuteronomy chapter 40, they're, 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 it, it, they're acknowledging their sin, but they continue to sin. And look at what verse 41 says. Moses is going to say the same thing he said in Deuteronomy. And Moses said, Wherefore now do ye transgress the commandment of the Lord? But it shall not prosper. We, we need to understand. We, we, we really do. We, we got to stop. We, we have to stop thinking that every time someone does something that God doesn't want them to do, and someone will come along talking about it's God's plan. No, God's plan was actually for you to do what he wanted you to do. Keep following him. Not for you to keep doing what you want to do and then think that God is with you in your pride. We get so many people, they do this type of stuff all the time. And always talking about God is with them. No. You're not with God, so how can God be with you? God is with those who are with him. God is waiting on people. Repentance. People think it means to change behavior. No. Repentance is a changing of the mind. And when we change our mind, isn't it powerful that when we change our minds, the Bible is telling us something. We turn from the world, meaning our minds, 
we change our minds and we turn from the world and we turn towards God. And when we turn towards God and face God, God does not turn his back on us. God faces us and we are face to face in a relationship with God. And when God leads, we follows. And that means we're with God. And Moses is telling them something. God is not with y'all. God is not with y'all on this because God has told y'all what to do and you're not doing it. And so we have to make sure that we follow God so that we will be with God so that and, and, and stop thinking when we go through things, God has left us. No, God is with us when we do. That's why Caleb told them we can take the land as long as we have the light in the eyes of God. That's what Caleb told him. That's what Caleb told him. And so we have to be the same way. We stay with God because God never leaves us. We leave God. And so as we continue to look at this, it's, it's very powerful. It's very powerful. And so Moses is telling them that, that God is not with you. You're going to be beat before your enemies. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and you shall fall by the sword. Here it is. Look at what Moses says. Why? Because ye are turned away from the Lord. I'm telling you, that's what repentance is, to turn towards God. They didn't repent. They didn't repent. They turned away from God, and they turned away from God by disobeying God. That's why Moses is telling them, God is not with you. God is not with you. And so he says, look, but they presumed, the Bible says, but they presumed, there it is, to go above what God has said. They presumed, presumption, presume, to go up, up, unto, to go up unto the hill top. Nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. Amen, Walls. We got to understand something. That when people make the, when they make the decision not to follow God, we have to make the decision not to go along with those people. Are we seeing this? Now, Moses loved those people, but God told Moses, that as surely as I am alive, those people will not enter into the promised land. And let me tell you something. God will even use the enemies of God against the people of God when they don't want to do what God told them to do. Are we seeing this? Sometimes we don't understand why we're going through some of the things that we go through in our life, in our relationships, in our country, in our world. Let's just say it how it is. Because God is not pleased with the people of God sometimes. And especially the people who are supposed to be the people of God, but they've turned their back on God. When God is not pleased with the people of God, God has done this so many times in the past. God will use the enemies of God to capture the people of God, destroy the people of God, smite the people of God, because God is telling them, without me, you can do nothing. And when we leave God, God is not with us. Not because he left us, because we left God. Because see, Moses is telling them something. That's why when the Bible says the Ark of the Covenant, see, the issue is, when we look at, uh, let's see if we can, if I can pull it up here. When we look at Numbers 1030, Numbers 1033, so they departed from the mountain of the Lord on a journey of three days. And look at this. Notice when they went on that journey and the ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them for the three days. Are we seeing this? They're being led by God. And Moses is telling them, God is not leading you in this. God is not with you in this. God is not neither leading you nor behind you in your evil. People think God is with them when they do evil. God isn't with people when they do evil because God is not capable of evil. God doesn't want evil. People say some of the silliest stuff. Well, God put that in my life. 
God is not putting evil in your life. God is not putting evil in your life. God may allow certain things in your life. God may allow evil in your life, but God is not allowing evil into your life for you to succumb to evil. God allows evil in your life to warn you from falling away from him. It's a difference. But people act like God is like the devil and put evil in their life so that they can indulge in evil. God doesn't allow bad things in our lives for us to indulge. But God allows bad things in our lives to warn us, to keep us turned towards him, to keep us focused on him and not on all of these crazy things. That's why it's so powerful when you look at this because, look, Moses, it says, look, it went three, it went before them for three days journey. Look, to search out a resting place for them. And the cloud of the Lord was above them by the day when they went out from the camp. So it was whenever the ark set out that Moses said, rise, O Lord, let your enemies be scattered and let those who hate you flee before you. And when it rested, he said, return, O Lord, to the many thousands of Israel. Are we seeing this? God was telling them, I mean, Moses was telling them something. Mm -mm. God is not with y'all. He's not leading you. He's not above you. He's not behind you. He's already told y'all what to do and you still will not listen. God is long suffering, but we better understand something. God is long suffering, but he's not going to chase us. He's not going to chase us. God is not going to make us follow him. He wants us to follow him willingly. And Moses warned him. And you can warn people about hell all you want to. You can tell them, as, as my wife always says, if people think it's hot outside, they ought to follow God. Amen, Walls. You can literally tell people hell is hot and they'll still do what they want to do. Still do what they want to do. Why? Because when people leave God, you can't tell them anything. You can't tell them anything. They will do what they want to do. And look at verse 45 as we close. Look at this. Then, watch this. Cause and effect. They did not do what God wanted them to do. And then the Amalekites came down and the Canaanites, which dwelt in the hill and the Bible says, and smote them and discomfited them even unto Hormah. The Bible is saying they were obliterated. They were obliterated. This is what happens when people do not obey God. They get obliterated. Some folks are out here getting used and abused and all kinds of things. Why? Because they left God. God is not with people and they're wondering, why am I getting so beat down? Why am I getting so beat up? What is going on in my life? You better ask the prodigal son. When the prodigal son found himself with the pigs in the slop and everyone knows that the, how the, the Israelites didn't like pork because it was something that God told them that they were not, the, the swine was dirty. And there they are in the very thing that God didn't want them in. And he's eating the same food that the swine eat. How far do people have to fall before they follow God? Now, the prodigal son was able to make him make his way back. But these people in the book of Numbers, they were not able to make themselves back because pride comes before the fall. And when they fail, they fail and they couldn't get up. They couldn't get up. Why? Because God was no longer with them. They didn't put their trust in God. They didn't obey God. And when they fail God, God said, I suffered you long enough and it's over. 
And that's what it's going to be like for people in the end. That's what it's going to be like for people in the end. We cannot take the grace of God, the mercy of God, the long suffering of God. We cannot take that for granted. We cannot take that for granted. And we're going to leave on this. We're going to leave on this. I got to give you this powerful verse as we look to the New Testament. Let me see if I can pull this up on my screen here. Jesus said something very powerful in the gospel of John. John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Jesus says in John 15, 1, I am the true vine and my father is the husband man. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken to you. Amen. We get so many people that when they hear the word of God, they don't want to obey the word of God. And you can tell them the word of God and they will argue and they will justify and they will do whatever they can do to get what they want to get. But we need to understand something. We must be clean by the word of God. Now, that's not talking about that baptism is not essential. But what that's talking about is I talked about on Wednesday, the changed mind. See, when we get baptized in the Christ, that's we're, we're answering our good conscience, meaning that we heard right. Now we want to do right. And once we do right, we need to continue to do right. Wow. Through the word of God. And look at this verse four. Abide in me and I in you. We need to understand something. When we are not in God, God is not in us. When we're not in God, God is not in us. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. Amen. These people in the book of Numbers, they didn't stay with God. They didn't stay with God. They decided to do what they wanted to do. And when we do that, God is not pleased. And we have to stop being the kinds of people to where we got all of these people. They would much rather lift up the the wicked than to praise and follow the righteous. We're in a world today that would rather persecute the righteous. And every time someone does something wrong, someone steps up and tries to justify the person that is doing wrong. It makes no sense. It's nonsense. And even God told Moses when Moses tried to intercede on those people, God said, this is an evil congregation, a wicked generation. I'm not going to justify them. They're wrong and they are going to get what comes to them. Verse five, as we finished. Jesus said, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. We cannot do nothing without God. We cannot do nothing without answering the gospel of Jesus Christ. We cannot do nothing without following the word through the Holy Spirit of God. We can do absolutely nothing. Now, we can do things, but they're not going to succeed. Now, someone says, well, I am successful. Look at my home. Look at my cars. That's not success in the eyes of God. When we look at Lazarus and the rich man, Lazarus, obviously had a, something so wrong with his skin that he, he suffered. It's obvious he didn't have financial uh, success as we would call success today. And he was at the doorstep of a king and he would not feed him. Now, the rich man had all the success. The rich man had all the success. He was at the doorstep of a rich man. I'm sorry, he's at the doorstep of a rich man. The rich man had success. He felt he had made it. Representative of the Pharisees thought he had made it. 
But when the time came and they both died, I could only imagine the funeral that the rich man could have paid for himself. But the Bible says the angels carried off Lazarus. And when they got to paradise, there was a gulf between them. And now the fortune was on the side of Lazarus. Now he's rich. And now who's truly poor came to fruition, the rich man. People do everything they can do to save their life and lose their souls. And that's what happened in the book of Numbers. And that's what we have to understand. When is God not with us? God is not with us when we do what we want to do and not what God wants us to do. So that's going to be our time. I mean, I, I'm, I know that no one, no one caught this on the uh, live, but many people are watching this on the replay. So when you watch this on the replay, make sure you share it and spread it to people and help someone in your life who may have left God and let them know God has not left you, but you left God. So until the next time, may God bless you. May God keep you. Peace. Oh, no man coming unto the Father, except they come through He. He is the way, oh, He is the truth, oh, he, he is the life. I said that He is the way, the way, the way, the truth, the truth. I said that He is the way, He is the truth, He is the life. I know that He is the way, the way, the way, He is the truth, the truth.